Welcome to today's webinar. I'm super excited to have my friend and colleague, Wendy Vittori, here with me today. Probably the fourth, fifth, or sixth webinar we've done together. We, we enjoy doing these. Uh, we learn a lot from each other as we put them together. Um, yeah, we're a little bit like, you know, frickin' frack. But anyway, here we are together. It's going to be fun. We're going to talk to you today about making material, making healthy material selection accessible to all project teams. So really to set the stage again, um, material health practice has really evolved in the last 10 years and Wendy's gonna to speak to that. And thanks to the work of the HPDC and Wendy and the whole ecosystem uh, involved in creating the open standard, many foundational components both from an analysis perspective, data and technology are in place to make it possible to automate the screening of chemical ingredients to a set of criteria, now making it possible for really leading edge material health practice to be available to any project team. So it's a very exciting time. Uh, the agenda, pretty simple. For those of you who are new to Sustainable Minds, I'll do a little bit of an introduction to the company and to the transparency catalog, then I'll turn it over to Wendy uh, to talk about what's happening at the HPDC, actually what has happened over time and what's happening going forward. And then, as promised, I'm going to do a overview of the transparency catalog and project builder and library sneak preview and demo if you have questions, please put them into the questions panel. We'll try to answer them during the webinar if possible, or we'll answer them uh, afterwards. We'll follow up any unanswered questions. This webinar is being recorded. You will get a copy of the recording emailed to you. You don't need to request it. If you want a copy of the deck, you can request that uh, when we send out the recording. and. Uh, like I said, sit sit back and be prepared for a lot of, a lot of information. So again, for those of you who are new to Sustainable Minds, we are the only end-to-end -end product transparency solutions provider in the market today. And I didn't introduce myself, but I'm Terry Swack. I'm the founder and CEO of Sustainable Minds. I founded the company in 2017 uh, with the mission to operationalize environmental performance and, and now material health into mainstream product development and manufacturing to drive revenue and growth through greener and healthier product innovation. It's a big mouthful, but all that to say, Sustainable Minds has always been the advocate for manufacturers to provide knowledge and tools to manufacturers to drive performance improvement in product development so they actually can be reporting higher performing products to the marketplace and winning business because they're actually making higher performing greener and healthier products. So we look at the whole transparency process, even though it's a very, very technical process, it is all in service to help manufacturers market their products. And so we have this mentality of seamlessly integrating product transparency into product marketing for manufacturers to build credibility, preference, and, and value for their brand. So product transparency is really about performance. Uh, it's part of the definition of high performance and how the industry defines successful buildings. Environmental performance and material health are performance criteria that are used both in the manufacture of products and now in the selection of products. You know, it's important to keep in mind that the primary intent for doing LCAs and material assessments is for the manufacturer to gain insights into the environmental and human health aspects over the life cycle of its products to drive that information back into product development again to be able to voluntarily report uh, those results to the marketplace. But, you know, now transparency has become. Uh, really pretty mainstream and in many instances 
Uh, it has become a specification and project requirement. And there are many, many manufacturers now who have invested in transparency. And there was a time when just having disclosures was enough to check a box to get into a project. Uh, today, there are so many manufacturers who are reporting. Uh, people are really looking for actually higher performing products. Performance matters. And so it's very important that manufacturers and their reps who speak to the marketplace can speak to these performance criteria with as much knowledge as they speak to the other performance criteria that they sell to all day long, functional performance, cost, aesthetic, safety, because integrating performance, transparency performance criteria into the whole presentation of the product is what makes people believe that the brand actually knows what they're doing and that's what builds trust and that trust leads to uh, results. So this is a screenshot, here's the transparency catalog. We are entirely focused on high performance building and construction materials that meet carbon impact and material health goals. We launched the catalog in 2016 with only 350 manufacturers anywhere in the world investing in creating EPDs or material ingredient disclosures for the products distributed in North America. And today you'll see that number has grown. We have over 2,200 manufacturers and industry organizations in the catalog and their products with transparency, again, EPDs or material ingredient disclosures. And we made the choice to have the catalog focus only on that type of documentation largely because it's multi-attribute and together it really gives a 360 view of products. We also knew that for products to get into projects, they need to be able to be specified. And so the catalog has always been organized by master format. So really what we're trying to do is simplify the selection of materials through the lens of transparency and that's the innovation, is radically simplifying the delivery of that information, again, so that the investments that the manufacturers are making in transparency pay off for them and the industry, because if people are selecting, specifying, and procuring actually higher performing products, that's how we transform the built environment. So, Again, just to uh, restate, the catalog includes every EPD from all program operators in North America, product specific, industry average, and optimized, and they're all identified as such. And we have APIs, with these programs, HPD declare, cradle to cradle, and we manually add others uh, that manufacturers request that are eligible to contribute to the green building rating systems. And so it's a very comprehensive uh, view of the data. As I mentioned today, actually I got the number wrong of over 2,100 manufacturers across 28 master format divisions and over 1,270 sections. And we only add a master format section when there's content there. So that's representing tens of thousands of products. And I like to say there probably isn't uh, a building or construction project going on today where people would not be able to find products from manufacturers who have invested in transparency. So part of that simplification and, and ability to select actually higher performing products is not just taking data from the partner APIs to indicate, yes, there is a document there, there is a disclosure there, There's a, there is a specification there. We take the data that comes to us through the API and parse it so that the results uh, of what the disclosure is reporting is made understandable, more accessible. You don't really have to go into the disclosure. And so we're always looking for how do we actually leverage that information to make tools that make it even more reliable and faster for building professionals to apply the selection criteria that are important to them to be able to get those products into projects. 
And we've been working with Wendy and the HPDC since 2015, 2016. We really have a very like-minded mindset. We're both committed to simplifying product transparency and together making HPD data more understandable and meaningful. And again, we're super committed to building smarter tools that drive new workflows and make the information easy to use, not just easy to find. So today's webinar is all about adding this new filter, the precautionary list three filter. And we owe thanks to Tori and, and Mary at uh, Perkins and Will, who, when they started working with the HPDC to have the precautionary list built into the HPD version 2.3 additional list, they came to us and said, hey, would you be able to build a filter that would allow us to just find those HPDs uh, that don't contain any of the ingredients on our list? And we said, yeah, absolutely. If it's in the API, we can do that. And so a few months ago, we did build that uh, filter in, and, but I wanna show you what we're actually talking about. So in every HPD, HPD it's getting screened against uh, the green screen lists and now these additional lists that Wendy's gonna talk about. And it gets called out when a chemical shows up on any of these additional lists and it calls out which list, which agency and which list uh, it's coming from. And so that information is in the API. And so we pull that information out <clears throat> in the way we analyze the data so that we can bring it to you. But today the folks at Perkins and Will manually have to go through HPDs to see uh, if any of the ingredients in the HPD are on the list. And they had to do that before there was this additional list screen even. So <clears throat> they've been doing this by hand. Uh, we've added this filter. So literally in one click, we're simplifying, finding and selecting healthier materials. We actually took it a little bit further. Um, what you're seeing in the filter are uh, HPDs that uh, not only don't contain chemicals on the Perkins and Will precautionary list, but also screen at 100 parts per million are characterized, uh, screened and, and uh, identified, which actually, when he's gonna talk about, are the attributes of the new uh, pre-check list. And, uh, and you'll see that information, 100 parts per million characterized screen, highest chemical of concern, We've always displayed that information in the interface, uh, again, because we get that through the API. And we're gonna to finish today with really the end conclusion is not just finding information and having to use it on, on a one-off kind of basis, but now with Transparency Catalog Project Builder Library, bringing together this highly curated data set with what you'll see is a very sophisticated workflow tool People will now be able to instantly select materials, again, according to your selection criteria and save them in projects and libraries for use, reuse, and uh, knowledge capture. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Wendy. Thank you so much, uh, Terry, and thank you all for being here today. It's a real pleasure and honor to be able to have this webinar, you know, as Terry mentioned, we've, as we've been progressing these programs, we've had one, I don't know if it's quite every year, Terry, but Pretty quite much, a yeah. number of them. Mm -hmm. And it's just great to see the progress that is happening. And as Terry mentioned, a huge part of this is that we have this open innovation, collaborative ecosystem that's involving manufacturers, project teams, wherever they may be, uh, in an architecture design firm, in an owner firm, in a management firm, in a construction firm, throughout the entire realm <clears throat> of that. And then we have, obviously, uh, all of the individual people who are 
you know, working on this. And those now number in the thousands. And so it's wonderful to see all of you here today and be able to share some of the late, latest advances that we have. If we can go to the next slide. Uh, Terry alluded to the fact that in the transparency catalog, there are tens of thousands of products. There are over 40,000 building products that have a health product declaration associated with them. Each health product declaration can be for multiple products. And if we go to the next slide, <clears throat> you'll see that at this point, we have uh, over 11,500 HPDs that have been published by over 800 manufacturers. And in fact, we're seeing a rate of publication of over 250 new HPDs each month. And, and this is just uh, a rate that is actually growing. So we're seeing an increased number and we're seeing the rate of growth is accelerating. And this is really, really important to understand if you are someone who is at this point, perhaps not yet working in material health. Uh, perhaps you dipped into it a few years ago <clears throat> and it was pretty complicated. I mean, the fact of the matter was if you go back just five years ago, trying to do a lot of the things that today have become pretty easy and routine was complicated. And so what we're starting to see are a new influx of people who just really haven't started. As many people as we have who are participating today, which is amazing, there are tens of thousands of people who have yet to take that first step. There are thousands of manufacturers, thousands of project teams, many. And so what we need to do in order to enable the participation of every project and every product is we have to make it easier. We have to make it something that it, you don't need to invest hours and hours and hours in education. Of course, we want to have all that education there for those who want to do that. And I often use the example of something that we all probably have right next to us, which is our smartphone. These are amazing supercomputers. My own personal background is in the computing industry, where I participated in a number of initiatives. <clears throat> One of them that I sometimes talk about, and those of you who have heard me talk before have probably heard me mention it, is USB. Most of us probably use that every day to charge our phone and do a number of other tasks, data sharing and so on and so forth. Uh, I was involved myself in the origin of that particular open standard. And at the time we did that, we wanted to dramatically simplify how you connect peripherals to a computer. That was the goal because it was out of control and was too difficult. And all the amazing new things that people wanted to do with those devices, they, want, they all wanted to connect. Yet, when you went to plug them in, and some of you probably remember that time, well, it didn't always work. And we'd spend a lot of time at the beginning of calls just trying to get things to connect and all kinds of problems such as that. Those are the issues that we are trying to address through the HPD Open Standard by having, if we can go to the next slide, having a standard that is really talking about how we can go from a time where we didn't have reliable, accurate data that was easily available. We didn't have a broad awareness amongst people that you could do this and so on, to a time now where it's relatively easy and becoming easier to do. And so that takes a particular mindset, if we can go to the next slide, where you have to really be focused on how to make something that's inherently kind of complicated easier. And as we include more and more reporting, there's more and more data. So it's inherently actually more complex, yet at the same time, we have to make it easier. And so the HPD Open Standard is really about simplifying all of the tasks that are needed 
in order to accomplish that. The first of which is reporting the data. And that requires to know which pieces of data are we talking about and how exactly is it to be reported. And that is something that the HPD Open Standard comprehends. If we go to, if we click again, the next thing is about disclosure. So we know that there's a tremendous amount of complexity in disclosure. It ranges from how complete is this information? Can I get this information from my supply chain if I'm a manufacturer? Is it obtainable? Is it knowable for me? As many of you who are manufacturers that are on this call know, modern supply chains are highly complex. They involve a great deal of outsourcing and a lot of the activity that has gone on, particularly in the last several decades, has been about enabling more of a commodity purchasing capability through the uh, advances of information technology. So if I can specify what this part is, and then there are systems that can go out and procure it to a certain quality standard, knowing who actually made that nut or bolt or that chemical ingredient and so on becomes complicated in a world such as that because the end manufacturer of the product there may be multiple levels of that supply chain that are not actually known to them and so this is where we have to work through a lot of that complexity and develop the kinds of systems and ecosystem partners in the supply chain management area in particular for example toxnot is a great one that we have worked with extensively who are really dedicated to working on enabling manufacturers to ask about this information all the way down to the bottom of that supply chain. And so in order to enable a manufacturer today, we have to have different levels of disclosure be possible. And at the same time, we have to say, you know, it's better if more is disclosed. There's also confidential business information. So if there's an agreement in place that a proprietary formula cannot be shared, what do we do about that? How do we work around that complexity? Well, early on, we developed a system so that such, a, such an ingredient could actually be screened for the human and environmental health impacts and then not actually the identity of it not disclosed. It's better if it's disclosed it's more transparent if it's disclosed, but it enables manufacturers to participate in material health without being able to know, even themselves sometimes, very often, the contents of that proprietary formula are not actually known to the manufacturer who's using it in their products. And so these are examples of the kind of complexity that we've been working to bring standard approaches to that everyone can agree through a stakeholder consensus process, which is how the HPD Open Standard operates, meet the needs to advance our knowledge of human and environmental health impacts of the products that we use to build our buildings. And then the final one, if we can click again, is transparency. We are an advocate of transparency, meaning in advocating for manufacturers to make public this information. And that 11,500 plus HPDs have been voluntarily made public by their manufacturers. And that's significant. That's not something that has happened on that scale before. And so when we create a system where there are incentives and rewards for doing this work, for manufacturers to invest in this, is where we can encourage that increasing rate of growth and that's what we're seeing and so if we go to the next slide i'll just talk a little bit about <clears throat> what are the components of this standard how do we do that the standard includes the step-by-step -step reporting instructions the actual standardized format which you see illustrated here and then in areas that are emerging we've developed a methodology we call best practices so that we can more uh, quickly adapt to the growth in understanding and knowledge of how to do something that's new 
because a lot of what we're doing now is new. People have not been reporting on this information before. And so we're agreeing on how collectively as a community to do it in a standardized way. And then we're putting it out there and we're starting to use it. And so we want to really encourage that learning process. If we learn a better way to do it, we want to be able to adapt that and rapidly move it forward. And so the HPD Open Standard has been developed, the methodology behind it to support that kind of rapid transformation, learning, knowledge growth environment that we really want to promote. So go to the next slide. Manufacturer is the one responsible for putting their information in, and that is fundamental. This has to be an initiative that manufacturers embrace in order for this to work. So there has to be value back to the manufacturer. And one of the greatest values is for manufacturers themselves to be able to use these systems to learn what is in their products and how are those ingredients related to human and environmental health. The systems that we have put in place, both our uh, tools at HPDC, which are our HPD Builder and our HPD Public Repository, and then very importantly, the tools and systems of our ecosystem partners, such as Sustainable Minds, is how this no learning and knowledge can happen. And so we're really contributing something that if you think about how would I find this out otherwise, I'm gonna go and do Google searches on every chemical and try and discover that. Really, really difficult, too difficult. Very few would do that. Some were doing it, but too difficult for the vast majority. Again, we want, we want a system that every manufacturer, every product can easily participate in. And then the end result, when we have the reports, every project team can use them and make decisions based on them. So if we go to the next slide. And so what ends up happening is a, a complex product like a chair, we can produce a standardized report, which we call an HPD, and you see it illustrated here, that in a standardized format with a well-proven methodology will report to the extent that the manufacturer is able to report, disclose, and make transparent that information, it will be there and it'll be accurate, reliable, and consistent. And that is really important because if you do not have a consistent method, it's really not valid to compare one product to another. In the HPD methodology, all the reporting is, is consistent across products and product categories. So I can actually compare the material health information about a chair with the material health information about a paint, the material health information about a ceiling tile. And if I am a designing a room that can, contains those products and any other products, I can think as a project team, how do I optimize my project for human and environmental health. And the data in the HPDs will enable you to do that. And as Terry's gonna to illustrate, tools such as what have been developed by Sustainable Minds can then bring this information together across those products and then integrate it with other sustainability criteria that are really important to consider as well. So that's, that's basically how the system works. If we go to the next slide, these are the first steps. So that optimization of the product is really the, and the project, those are the end results. So reporting on the information, disclosing the information, and then how do we take those next steps to optimization? If we go to the next slide. So I wanna just give a quick update on the most recent capabilities that we are building into the HPD. It has versions that uh, new updates come out approximately every year. And the most recent one was version 2.3, <clears throat> which came out in July a year ago. And it included some really important new uh, reporting and screening type of features such as, for example, the LEED v4.1 pre-checks. If you are a project team member and you're trying to determine 
whether a product meets the lead criteria, part of the system that's been developed for HPDs automatically pre-checks for that. And then we're able to actually export that um, result to groups such as Sustainable Minds, who can then just report on those. And we also have things called special conditions. These handle materials that are not easily reportable at the chemical ingredient level. For example, wood or stone, those types of products. Um, a new one you can see down below, polymers. This is an area that's really, really complicated from a technical standpoint. And so having a standard way of allowing a manufacturer to report on these types of ingredients that goes beyond just uh, the chemical cat, what we call the CAS number, that's the identifier that is a system for chemicals and hazards that are associated with that, but has some contextual knowledge of how these products are used in the built environment has turned out to be very, very valuable. So we invest a lot of time at HPDC on things like special conditions. And then additional listings, and I'll comment on this in a moment because Terry brought that up, and that's where the Perkins and Will precautionary list comes in. And then if we go forward, we have a new update that's coming out next month, <clears throat> and we will be having webinars specifically on this. Uh, if you've attended HPDC's user advisory or ma manufacturer advisory calls. If you're an HPDC member, you got an update on that. We'll be having more detailed webinars coming up uh, very soon. And so uh, in this, we have antimicrobial reporting. This is a, a new area that became particularly of concern to people during the pandemic when we started to see a lot of the use of antimicrobials uh, growing. And so, so there are different reasons why antimicrobials are added into building products. And so this reporting method helps manufacturers standardize their understanding of why that ingredient would be added and how it is reported out to a project team so they can understand it. We also have a growing interest uh, in the intersection of social equity and material health. Social equity is really about how do these material health characteristics impact different groups. For example, a fence line community that may be adjacent to a manufacturing plant. There's actual information about that, that we can help both manufacturers and project teams understand. So that's what that's about. Product types is about making sort of the vernacular that architecture and design firms often use to describe products, but is not exactly aligned with the CSI classification, which we also use. That is the foundational organizational tool in HPDs, just as it is in the transparency catalog. And so this, if you use a term like drywall, how do we map that actually into CSI master format so that project team member could actually talk about drywall? Um, polymers, I've already talked about. The program pre-check is exactly like the precautionary um, list that Terry has talked about and is generalized to more different kinds of uh, programs that are going to be out there. And then Chem Forward, some of you may have heard about Chem Forward. This is a new type of uh, assessment methodology that is focused on understanding alternatives, safer alternatives. And so we are working with them to bring forward those types of results in HPDs. And it's important to know that if you're a manufacturer and you want to take advantage of the 2.3 or 2.3 update features, it's very easy to go in. If you published an HPD under version 2.2, for example, very easy to go in the builder and update to the newest specification. We'd really encourage you to look at doing that. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, just a little bit on additional listings more. This is something that we had a lot of requests uh, for this information to be in HPDs exactly so that the sorts of work that Terry and her team have done 
at Sustainable Minds would become easy uh, to do because we did have the chemical ingredients available, but to actually provide that pre-screening of the criteria of the precautionary list is something that makes it much more complicated. So we now in our API from our HPD public repository are able to export those results and it makes it much easier for tools like the transparency catalog to take that information and present it in this very uh, holistic way that Terry is going to share with you in a moment. If we can go to the next slide. And this is just an example, uh, I think Cherry showed it earlier, of how, and these are the initial uh, lists that are included, uh, the LBC red list, the C2C um, uh, restricted substances list, the safer chemical ingredients list. Now that's a positive list in the sense that it's identifying safer ingredients. The six classes, lots of growing interest in six classes. If you're involved with European, products, uh, reach exemption list is important, and then the purpose and will precautionary list. If we go to the next slide. So all of this, because we have those standards, we have this plug and play compatibility. If a manufacturer reports their data using an HPD, that is very easily shared across this broad ecosystem of programs. And if we go to the next slide, this is uh, what it comprehends today. Quite a number of programs uh, where we work together with the rating systems, certifications, um, manufacturers, uh, supply chain type of tools, the product libraries and project team tools such as the transparency catalog. And if we go to the next slide, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Terry to give you a little more information about how all this is going to come into play in this new set of features that she's launched in the Transparency Catalog. Well, thank you, Wendy. Uh, you guys are doing great work over there. And um, full disclosure, I'm a member of the technical committee, and I'm amazed by all of the work that's happening uh, there behind the scenes in the, in the various committees and, and um, always excited to hear your strategy presentations and you know, really kind of framing what the work is so that people can understand you know, what it is today and, and where it is continuing to go. So thank you, Wendy, for your, for your leadership and vision. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, all right, so here we are back to the transparency catalog and again, really focused on helping the building construction industry find quickly all the high performance building materials that meet their various carbon impact goals and material health goals. So to give you an idea of how we create the data set, because we're, what we're bringing together now is this data set that we've been building and curating uh, since 2016, and now finally merging it with these advanced collaboration tools. Which I'll give you a peek at the end. But this is how this is how it all works. So we have a great data team, and we have APIs. Uh, because we are an EPD program operator, uh, we actually monitor all the North American program operator websites for any time a new EPD gets published. And in fact, anytime a new material ingredient disclosure gets published, we will add that manufacturer to the transparency catalog and add links to their disclosures. And that is what a free listing is. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like in just a, just a moment. Then what we do is we invite manufacturers to activate their listing, which means adding product information, contact information. We've built in kind of sales and social media tools, uh, partner, uh, content. But at the core of the listing is this product table. And the product table, whoops, product table is a matrix. The horizontal axis is the master format section that the product is in. And the vertical axis starts on the left is the product name, which links to the manufacturer's product page on their website. 
and then we correlate the EPDs or the material ingredient disclosures that go with each product. And we tell manufacturers, people don't care how many disclosures you have. They only care that if they're specifying one of these products on the left, that they know that the EPD and the material disclosures that are for that product are right there. They don't have to search, they don't have to hunt around. And you can see that we have brought, again, information from the disclosure into the interface so a user can see very quickly you know, who's the program operator, what's the scope of the EPD, the validity period on the material side, what's the technical program, what are the results here? You're seeing declare label. So what are the results of that declare label? Again, the validity period. We've got tool tips built in. I'll show you quickly when we go to the live site that explain what all of these program level results mean. So people don't have to be uh, knowledgeable from the get-go about, about what they're looking at. But what's key here is we don't believe that manufacturers should manage a lot of content that is not on their website. The website should be the single source of truth. And so this listing is really like a microsite of their company's website through the lens of transparency. And so what we do is we uh, you know, build in access to a lot of the tools on their site. And you'll see that in the contact form in just a moment. But because our focus has been on EPDs and material ingredient disclosures from the beginning, because a lot of the manufacturers who have invested in transparency already had the single attribute disclosures, or the documents required for the green building rating systems. And so because we don't want, again, for manufacturers to have to manage so much stuff other places, and also because uh, you know we get all the data for the, the EPDs and material ingredient disclosures through APIs, and we manage that, the manufacturer is not managing that. What we're doing is we're identifying any additional sustainability, product sustainability documents that the manufacturer has, telling the user what they have. So here you can see GAF has Green Guard, Green Guard Gold. They've got some uh, Green Circle certified disclosures for sourcing raw materials but we're telling the user where to go find it. And there's one of three options. The first option is if the manufacturer's website is organized and they have the links to these additional disclosures on the product page itself, then this text would say, go to the product page link above to find this additional documentation. Uh, if the manufacturer's website is not that well organized, many of them have download pages, which I'm sure you've all seen, where you can go, they have all the PDFs for all their documentation. Uh, and so that would be the second option. We'll send people to that download page so they can find these specific types of documents. And the third is if they don't have either of those things on their websites, but they've invested in Mindful Materials, then we'll send them to the Mindful Materials portal and we will have pre-configured the search so that when they click that link, the manufacturer's products will show up. Now we've also uh, created this customized contact form so that building professionals can opt to get help however they like. So the right side of the form allows you to put in your question, uh, what you want information about. You can tell the manufacturer a little, about, a little bit about your project, not required, and send that in and get a response. Or the left side of the contact form is customized by every manufacturer to give you access to the people to call, their email addresses, their phone numbers, if you just want to pick up the phone, and then further links to resources on their website uh, that you might want to access when you're looking for a sample spec quote in submittal help. Now we've had this integration with the EC3 tool since they were in alpha. Uh, again, we're a program operator. We deliver LCAs, we publish EPDs, so we're you know very much uh, living in that space and have been for many years. So when the EC3 tool was getting developed, uh, we met uh, with Stacy and Phil and, and the team and took a look at the methodology under the Carbon Leadership Forum, which was very innovative, which was to create industry ranges based on 
pulling the embodied carbon from EPDs, developing an industry range of lowest to highest, 20th to 80th percentile. So we said, okay, let's do this. Let's just kind of slice up that bar chart and create these colored quintiles so we could add them to the table in a manufacturer's listing along with the other EPD information and a link directly to into the EC3 tool so that in a glance, a user can see if that EPD is reporting that that product, you know, what, what percentile is that of embodied carbon is that product relative to others in that category. And so you can see uh, the other visual indicators. In this case, Armstrong has declare labels. You can see a product has a red list free declare label and it's in the 40th percentile or whatever it is, a user can start pretty quickly applying their selection criteria uh, to determine uh, products that are gonna fit, fit their requirements. And so because we have all of that embodied carbon data through the EC3 tool and we use those quintiles, uh, we built this filter to filter by quintile. So let's say you're really looking for the lowest embodied carbon materials possible in the 20th percentile, before you even do any other filtering in master format or rating system, anything. And again, because you can use these filters in any order, you could simply select the quintile that thresholds that are acceptable to you, and you're only gonna see those results. And uh, so, you know, very quickly getting to just the things uh, that you're looking for. So a free listing, and this is important, our commitment to the industry is that you will find every building product manufacturer making products for the North American market who have invested in product transparency, either EPDs or material ingredient disclosures. And so we create a free listing. So you'll be able to find those disclosures and in search results, they'll come up in every master format section uh, they're in. And we assign the master format section. Actually, HPDs are the only uh, tool that, that have reliably master format sections. Some EPDs do, some don't, uh, but we assign the appropriate sections. They show up in search results. But uh, the brands that always show up at the top or first or on the first few pages of search results are the brands that have activated their listing because people don't specify disclosures. They specify products with disclosures. And as more and more manufacturers are publishing more and more disclosures for more and more of their products, those brands that are out ahead doing that work are getting a ton of visibility. And our analytics bear out that brands who are activating their listing are getting five to 50 times more visibility in master format searching, in page views, in clicks and downloads. And we have this analytics dashboard that every manufacturer gets as part of their annual subscription when they've activated their listing. They can not only track all of the activity and visibility to their brand, they can see all of that visibility literally complete transparency with every other brand in the catalog. So their competitors, leaders in other categories, uh, because again, we're a mission-based company. We're trying to change the way the built environment gets built. We want manufacturers to do better, make better products. And so part of helping that happen is to create competition. And so every manufacturer has people in their organization that every year have a meeting to say, what are we gonna spend on transparency this year? What are we gonna, are we gonna create any new EPDs? Are we gonna make more HPDs? Which product should we do it for? And so they can use the analytics to look at their competitors. They can see what disclosures their competitors have created for which products. They can see how much visibility and traction their competitors are getting on those products. And then they have real data to be able to inform the decisions about how they're going to bring their products to market and have a leadership position uh, in the high performance, greener and healthier uh, building market. So now this quick preview of Project Builder and Library. You know, we've spent 
seven years designing Project Builder and Library. Uh, we've had, no exaggeration, hundreds of conversations with manufacturers as well as architects, engineers, contractors, owners of, of real estate to understand the gaps today in the workflows between early stage selection, specification, pre-construction, construction and installation, and even ongoing maintenance. There are no standardized workflows. There are no tools that connect those stages. So it's really a challenge for project teams to get the actual products from the brands they want and trust into the projects that they're building and that everybody has access to the same information so that those decisions that are made in the beginning can be carried through and ultimately reach their final conclusion of getting procured and installed. So the way that it works is that uh, the transparency catalog is, is, uh, is wealth of, of product information that users can go in and then select products to add to projects or add to libraries. You'll see we've built in an automatic export to the EC3 tool so people can build projects in the transparency catalog, export them to EC3 to automatically start to uh, measure and compare uh, whole building projects. And the important thing to keep in mind is what we've designed is that projects are just containers for products. And that's where all the work happens. So a container can be actually a specific project. Can You have every master format section that's going into that project for a very specific project. Or it could be a project as a room type. So let's say your firm designs a lot of hospitals, for example, and the experts who design operating rooms have a list of materials or selection criteria that could be a project, an operating room project. Or a collection of products can be, again, based on any criteria. And you'll see in the example that I showed, you can create a project of Perkins & Will precautionary list free products in Division 7. Or every division, depends. it depends on who's doing the selection, how uh, your organization uh, wants to put their workflows together, because now we're enabling you to do things that you haven't been able to do, but you've really been needing to do. And you know, this last one, we really learned from understanding the, the specification space and the challenge of maintaining office master specifications where different people are experts on keeping up with product types in different divisions. And yet, all those people are supposed to be maintaining one office master specification. Well, this allows people to assign your, your mechanical leads, your interior leads, you know, product experts to curate their projects to keep those up to date so that when people are working on actual building projects, they can pull those products from projects or from libraries so that over time, what we imagine will happen is that people won't as frequently go to the full catalog to select materials. They'll pull products and materials from other projects and from their libraries. So key features of Project Builder is uh, you will get unlimited number of projects and templates. You can turn projects into templates so they can be reused unlimited number of collaborators, so people inside and outside your organization uh, have access to projects where you can um, share knowledge and opinions. Um, uh, there will, there's a centralized favorite products library for the organization, but each person gets their own favorite products library. Uh, what we're gonna be watching is how organizations create workflows uh, to execute the way they want to execute. And we're going to be creating uh, playbooks and sharing those playbooks with the marketplace so that not every firm has to go in and think about how are we going to do this. Uh, we want to get people up and running uh, so that everybody can act differently. I talked about the EC3 export and integrated into all of this selection and saving of projects is direct access to the manufacturers through that contact form 
and we're going to be building in some other ways so that you can contact the manufacturer in the context of when you're evaluating their products and that's exactly when they want to hear from you so uh it's in private beta right now uh if you sign up for a free transparency catalog account uh, you'll get notified when it goes live and very quickly i have a quick demo to show you it is in fact real so yeah so here i am i've already logged into um, my project builder and library account and I've come over here to my organization, Sustainable Minds Project Library, and I've built some example projects here. So here's my uh, Division 8 Openings Perkins and Will Precautionary List Free Project. I've already built it. There's four tabs in any, uh, uh, five tabs in a project. You've got project information, a bunch of attributes that you want to preserve about the project. You've got the Products tab, which is where you're going to be selecting products. Ultimately, you can save an installed view of the project when a product, when a project is a, actually about a building, as opposed to just a collection. There's a collaboration with as many people as you like, so the notifications is going to keep track. And here's the uh, EC3 export. But what I want to do is show you, um, and if I go back to uh, a project, so let's say I'm working on uh, uh, this commercial office building. And I, you can see I've already started to add a lot of products to this project. Uh, but let's say I'm, I want to add more. So I'm going to go over here and say uh, I want to add some products, but first I'm just going to go back out to the transparency catalog and let me look at division 12 and say I, I maybe I haven't done work on division 12 yet. I, I failed to look. But maybe now that we're in furnishings, um, I for sure want to find products that are Perkins and Will precautionary list free. So there's 13 brands and 216 products. Now I can go in and say, okay, really now I'm looking at window treatments. Look, there's three brands and 39 products, or I could look at uh, you know, any of these other, I want casework, maybe not window treatments. Now I can go through and say, okay, only Formica has precautionary list free. I want to go and do some research on these things but maybe not right now so i'm going to just add those all to my project and now uh, here i am in my commercial office building project and you can see that uh, all those casework products uh, are there right now and i'm reminded that all these products have epds and material ingredient disclosures that's going to take me to the product page on the manufacturer's website. I'm able to tag that if it's the base of design, if substitutions are going to be allowed, yes or no. I can go in here, and when I've shared the project with colleagues, we can be commenting and have discussion going on. More information about pricing can go here. And further, any more documentation, so any of those single attribute disclosures or BIM models or sustainability reports, anything else that people want to add can be uploaded, added here. And at any given time, people might say, you know, I love this product. We've done all this research. I'm going to save it to my office favorites. And so when I do that, this is optional. The user who's saving it can say why they're adding it to the office library. And they might say just, you know, love the colors and, you know, whatever it is. And they're going to save that. So now when anybody goes to the library and browses through the library, master format section, master by format section, they're going to see who added it, the date they added it, the reason they added it, and they can go in and learn more. And later, they're working on a project, they can go to the library, pull this product in. So that is the quick demo I wanted to show today. Uh, Wendy? I'm just going yes, to do sir. a quick look and see if there are burning questions, even though we are right at the top of the hour. Any wrap up you want to uh, leave people with? Uh, just to thank you, Terry, for inviting us today and all the great work that 
your your team is doing, our our really wonderful collaboration over quite a number of years, and looking forward to the next steps that are going to be unfolding soon as we continue to advance what can be done simply, easily, more and more capability and material health practice. So thank you. Yeah. Well, there are a couple of questions that can be answered quickly. Um, one attendee asked, is there a way to find out which products will or will not be tagged on the precautionary list? And, and yes, that way is to use the filter to see which have been. Uh, that's gonna be the easiest way to do it. Uh, next question is, can I speak to any relationship, if there is one, to the LBC red list imperative? So, yeah, we're partners with ILFI. We have the DECLARE uh, API that includes not only all of the DECLARE products, but also the um, uh, living, product, living product challenge products. And those are indicated. You can filter. There's filters for those. We've had those a, a long time. You can filter by rating system credit, or you can filter by disclosure type in one click in the very same way. And the last question is, uh, yes, recording will be shared. And that's pretty much the questions. Wendy, thanks so much. And uh, for those of you who stayed the whole time, thank you so much. There's some survey questions if you'd be so kind as to respond to on your way out. And look forward to meeting with you all again. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you, Terry. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.